This is the day that the Lord has made. Okay, one of two things. Either it's the rain, or people forgot to set their clocks in ahead an hour. And that's how they're all feeling about right now. Oh, after all those announcements, then I forgot. I, I put a meme up on my Facebook. It had, a, it had a picture of a hymnal open to a hymn, and it said, This is the recessional hymn, or the hymn that people who forgot to set their clocks are coming to church on. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's one of those things that happens. And, uh, but I, I, I hear there's a, uh, a bill that is trying to be floated to keep at the same time all the time. We'll, 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 we'll see if our legislature, legislatures in Washington, D.C. can come together on one thing uh, in doing that. Then we don't have to fool with messing with the clocks anymore. Uh, that, would be, that would be a good thing, especially on spring when you're like, oh, golly. Yeah. Well, we do have a couple of announcements. Uh, our Lenten midweeks continue this Wednesday. Uh, they've been well attended. Again, uh, if you have signed up to provide something, please make sure you bring it. Uh, if you haven't, check because I'm sure there's still some blank s- spots for the weeks coming up. We have three, I believe, left. I think there's three left. So uh, bread and soup at 5 o'clock and then worship at 545 um, uh, it will be daylight when we <laughs> get finished. Uh, we were sort of twilight the last couple of weeks, but we will be daylight, uh, when, when it finishes this week. Um, we also want to announce that, uh, we will be installing our Stephen ministers, uh, Jean and Jan, uh, two weeks from today, uh, in our, uh, in our worship service. And so we want to lift up that ministry on that day. Also, uh, The results of the first survey, there are some hard copies out on the table where the offering plates are, if you need that. Otherwise, we will be sending them out uh, tomorrow along with, and I know the the second survey went out, there were some glitches with it. We are going to, we're we're in the midst of fixing the glitches. If you've already submitted it, I think you're good, Uh, but we are re re sending it. Uh, So uh, that will come out Monday along with the uh, survey results. Uh, So in case you are curious about what that first survey, what we learned from it, you will get some of that uh, understanding as as well as the the team that put it together. But uh, we are then getting ready for the second survey. Again, we give you two weeks. Uh, So uh, over the next two weeks, fill it out, send it in, and we'll have that information. Uh, Again, we are thankful that 48 people filled out the first one. Uh, If we can hit 60 or more, we will really be excited in that because the more more that are submitted, the more information that we gain from it. And so as we gather together as God's people this day, uh, you will hear in the text, there's a lot of water theme uh, in the texts this week. Perfect day for it. Uh, but uh, again, as, as we see it in the Old Testament, which I will be preaching on, and especially in the gospel, uh, where Jesus sits at the well with the Samaritan woman and tells her about living water, uh, as we have that water theme uh, for this day, uh, we take some time as the Holy Spirit uh, shapes our hearts and minds for our worship this day. Uh, take a moment of prayer. Let the Spirit guide your prayer. Use a hymn verse. Uh, contemplate one of the scripture passages. We do so as the candles are being lit and the prelude is being played.
as Christ's sacred head was wounded, as his blood was poured out uh, and shed for your and my sinful behavior, he now has brought us to the baptismal font where the waters of baptism flow out over us, uh, connected by the word of God to remind us that we are his children as we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite the congregation to please stand for the singing of the hymn. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Almighty God, we know and admit that we are sinners. We are conceived and born sinful, and we add on to that burden of sin throughout our lives by our, by our heedless thoughts, careless words, and loveless deeds. Indeed, we deserve God's punishment now and eternally. When we reflect honestly on our lives, we readily see that we need repentance and renewal that can only come through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us then make confession to our gracious God. Almighty God, we repent of our sins in thought and in word and in deed. You know too well our failings and our transgressions. Be merciful to us and for the sake of Jesus, grant us your forgiveness so that as your redeemed people, we may find rest in you and with refreshed hearts serve you in time and in eternity. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also Let us pray. O oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated.
The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Lent is from Exodus chapter 17. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people there thirsted for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there in the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The epistle is from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will sacrifice for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him 
will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or what are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation may be seated. And I invite the children to come forward for the children's message. There was a famous president that said, walk softly and carry a big stick. Do you think this is a big stick? Yeah. Actually, this was given to me by one of our members. It's a piece of wood from Alaska. What do you think you could use this big stick for? Can you, th- can you think of something that... right Right... And I I keep this in my office, so I don't use it much, but I probably could use it for a few things. So can you think of one thing that I could possibly use this big stick for? A hiking stick. Very good. Yeah, that perfect size, isn't it? Perfect size for a hiking stick. Would you use it for a hiking stick, Lisa? Lisa? Okay, a little crooked, little knobby, but it's got some character to it. It's got a lot of character. What else might you use this big stick for? A fishing pole. Yeah, you probably could rig it up. You'd get away out there, couldn't you? Fishing pole, that'd be a good one. What else do you think you might be able to use this big stick for? I know, I know in a few minutes... When I, when I preach the sermon, I could use it as a poking stick in case somebody starts falling asleep, do you think? <laughs> I could, couldn't I? Trouble is, from back here, I couldn't reach far enough, so I'd have to throw it at them. <laughs> yeah, that would be another. I, I know another use. This, this is one of the first ones I thought of. Uh, the altar guild. Judy, can you think of a use that the altar guild could have for this? We have a time getting that drape up there every year. And when it, 
When we put up the one for uh, Good Friday, it's a black one. Same thing. We got to take that one down and put the black one up. And then for Easter Sunday, we take the black one down and put the white one up. So this would be a great stick, at least for pulling it down. It might help us to put it up. So this one stick... We figured out at least four things that we could use it for. There might even be more. This is just an ordinary stick and four different things that we could use it for. You know what? Each one of us and all of them, we're ordinary people. Okay? Not much difference between us, right? Are you breathing? I think so. You're smiling. Uh, you can move around. Well, I know you're alive, but we're just ordinary people. But the amazing thing is, we just heard this morning there was a stick like this, an ordinary stick that Moses used. Actually, it was in Moses' hand, but God used. God used the ordinary stick when it touched the rock. Water flowed out so that people could drink. Now, I will tell you, I, I can go outside right now with this ordinary stick and touch a rock. Do you think water is going to flow out of it? Today it will because it's raining. <laughs> Usually, though, not. It won't, it won't normally do it. However, it's not because it was in Moses' hand. It wasn't because it's in my hand. It's because of the God who gave it the power to have water flow out of it. And you know what? With us ordinary people by ourselves, we can do some things, but we can't do the amazing things. But when God decides to use you and you and you, and you, and me, we're going to be pretty extraordinary because he can use us through the, through the speaking of our mouths, through the things that we do. Oh, by the way, through brisket sandwiches, he can do some amazing things to bring people to know him. So go, be your ordinary selves, but let God use you to do amazing things, okay? Thank you for coming up, and you may return to your seats. Don't force me to use this. Grace, peace, and mercy from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, in our Old Testament reading this day, uh, we get to a time when the children of Israel are wandering, still wandering. They are at the beginning of their wandering in the wilderness. And the one thing that they should know already, they should know the grace and the glory of God. Anybody in here know the grace and glory of God? I, I hope you should be raising your hands. Uh, you should, we all should know the grace and the glory of God. Uh, we look on the history of this congregation. We should know the grace and the glory of God because we shouldn't be here. From the starts of it, right, Peggy and Connie? From the starts of it and even today, we should not be here. But because of the grace and the glory of God, we still can be a vital, healthy avenue by which God does his work. Children of Israel should have known better. Because when we get to Exodus 17, where Lisa read the text today, they've already been rescued from Egypt. They've been delivered through the Red Sea. Now, come on, folks. A sea parting that they could walk through? Come on. That's pretty amazing stuff. That's grace and glory of God stuff. And the chapter before in 16, manna fell from heaven. We've got some good bread makers in this congregation. We see it on Wednesdays. 
but I haven't seen any of it fall from heaven. But they did. They saw the grace and glory of God. But the problem is when, when sometimes when we see that grace and glory of God too often, we become very comfortable in it. And we get to develop, when we've received such blessings over and 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 over again, we, we, we develop a be there, done that attitude. Or it might be, God, what have you done for me lately? And that's where we are at in Exodus 17, where the children of Israel see that they have no drinkable water or what I learned in, on Jeopardy, potable water. They have no drinkable water, and they're going, okay, God, what have you done for me lately? They've been taken to another demanding place. They realize that diffi the difficulty of life in the wilderness And they've learned that difficulty of life in the wilderness takes its toll. How about you? Have you been in those places in your life where you've experienced the difficulty of life in the wilderness? Where it seems that it has taken its toll. You may have seen it individually. I know we have seen spots of it in the congregation. And as a congregation, as All Saints Lutheran Church, we are like the children of Israel. We are a community on the move. And we are a community on the move with some serious limitations. We're old. That's a serious limitation. We wish we had... We had three children here today. We had an acolyte today. Isn't that great? Don't we wish we had more? We are a community on the move with serious limitations. And sometimes we find ourselves in that space where even the basic needs are lacking. And just like the children of Israel in that moment, when they were in that, sp that space where their basic need of water was lacking, it changes your state of mind. And, and, and especially with a congregation like ours, we could easily fall into the same trap that our state of mind can change and we begin to wonder, man, our future is just too uncertain. We're getting older. Our pastor is moving toward retirement. What do we do? What do we do? And just like the children of Israel, when you have this state of mind that your future is uncertain, you begin to question your well-being. You wonder, can, can your well-being survive this challenge? Or maybe you even feel that your well-being is being threatened. And typically when people feel like their well-being is challenged or threatened, they begin to complain a little bit. We never hear any complaints, do we? Whether it be in our community, whether it be in our world, our country, or even our congregation, when our well-being is challenged or threatened, complaints happen. And, and in the midst of those complaints, people are confronted uh, they, they, they are confronted by their situation, which causes them to confront people who might be able to do something about their situation. Usually we call those people leaders. 
Sometimes we go straight to the top to the pastor. Because somehow our situation doesn't seem like it's resolving itself. And so we begin to contest the leadership. We begin to contest the way that things are being done. Why can't we do it like we did 50 years ago? Maybe because it doesn't work. But all that the complaining and the confronting and the contesting does, it creates conflict. And in the midst of conflict, you find people with a lack of faith. And a lack of faith sees ineffectiveness. A lack of faith sees the ineffectiveness of programs. A lack of faith sees the ineffectiveness of leaders like Moses. That's why they were complaining to him. But as we see in the text, the lack of faith sees the ineffectiveness or the supposed ineffectiveness of God. Extreme need echoes an acute sense of God's absence, supposedly. An extreme need. Whenever we have that, that feeling that our need is too extreme, it's too beyond what can be taken care of, that extreme need echoes our acute sense that God must be absent. Because we find ourselves in a mindset where we fear life and death. And we come to a place in our mind and in our hearts, and sometimes even from our mouths, where we have forgotten what God has already done in the years before. At least I don't know if this counts. But in my sermon last week, I talked about Nicodemus and Nicodemus's question. How can these things be? If you are such a loving God, how can these things be? Or to paraphrase what the children of Israel said in our text today, hey, Lord, are you there? Have you ever been in that place? As a congregation, have we ever been at that place where, where we have asked the same questions? How can these things be? And we might even cry out in our despair, hey, Lord, are you there? But just as God did to Moses, he had to convince Moses' heart first before he could reach the children of Israel, if you didn't notice that. Because even Moses himself had forgotten what God had already done. That was the reason for the, him to say, take the big stick with you. Because just as you use that big stick to part the waters of the Red Sea, I want you to use that big stick to make water flow out of a rock. God is astutely aware of you and me, and God is astutely aware of our situation. God is astutely aware of our needs. And God appropriately provides for our needs in his own amazing way. He meets those needs in ways that we probably couldn't even think of. Water from a rock. Yeah, let's see that one. But maybe it might be a cancer that suddenly goes away. Maybe it might be simple that the pain in your hips no longer there anymore because of things called surgery. 
But God is astutely aware of you and me and our situation, and he, and he finds a way to appropriately provide those needs in his most amazing way. But even more importantly, he addresses the deep inability in our hearts to see him. He addresses the deep uncertainty in our hearts that our situation can be resolved. Because when we look out in this wilderness, it is filled with gifts from God. We might not notice them because they only look like a big stick. Or they look like a simple little child to light candles. Or they look like a pastor who attempts to use tools. But the wilderness is filled with many, many gifts from God. And as those gifts are used, they are a witness. They are a witness to God's promises that he has given to us in his word. And they are a witness to God's faithfulness in our life each and every day until eternity. Because as we come together in simple word, in simple sacrament, bread and wine and water, we discover who God is and what God has done for us. In simple word, in simple bread and wine, in simple water, God delivers you and me and all mankind from a horrendous, relationship with this world into his most loving hands to have a relationship with him. He brings salvation. And he reminds us that he will sustain us until we go to be with him in heaven. But just like he challenged Moses, he challenges you and me. Go ahead of the people. There are people in this world with little or no faith. On the new survey, you'll see the term called nuns, not N-U-N-S, not the ones that wear habits in the Catholic Church, N-O-N-E-S. The nuns are the ones who claim to be spiritual but not religious. They have no church affiliation. They're not in a regular place to hear the word of God like we are. But God is calling you and me, just like he called Moses, to go ahead of these people and be willing to be vulnerable, be willing to be humble. Because just like them, you and I, as I told the children, we're ordinary objects. We're ordinary people. And we're ordinary people given ordinary things to do the work of ministry here in Union County and the area around us. And he calls us to be used as his ordinary instruments, as his ordinary people. He calls us to use it in public view. Not to keep it within our own little congregation, but get out there in public view, and use those objects that he's given to us, including ourselves. Because as we use those things, as we use them as, as, as we are instruments in God's hands, we're going to provide a witness that points to the glory of God. And we're going to work some mighty wonders. Yes, even a pastor might be able to use Hand tools, power tools may be a different story. But we can work mighty wonders because we are instruments, we are tools within God's own hands. And because it's the power of God behind it, he's going to transform the landscape in which we find ourselves. We transform the landscape being those ordinary people in his hands 
as we carry our testimony, as we carry the trust that we have in God to do the things that we know that He can and will do, and as we share that hope with people that find themselves hopeless. We will be assured and we will carry the assurance of God's presence because it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so they're going to see Christ in what I do and what I say. And, and we will be assured ourselves, but we're going to bring that assurance of God's presence, of, uh, of God's power, of God's provision for our lives, but also for their lives as well. And one more thing, as the children of Israel found out, is you're going to discover that God is going to do the same thing once again and again and again. Walk softly and carry a big stick. Maybe not quite a big stick. But go walking. God has sent you and God has sent me. Ordinary people with ordinary gifts to do extraordinary things for his kingdom. Amen. As we reflect on God, how God intersects with his people at the crossroads of life and graciously meets their physical and spiritual needs, we speak the first article of the Apostles' Creed and its meaning as is set forth in the small catechism, which relates the loving work of God the Father for us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body, soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need, to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy, 
without any merit or worthiness in me. For this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Let us pray. We pray for God's will in various situations in the world, country, and community. Lord God and Father, we pray for your intervention among the nations and with the people of the world. Grant that we remember your generosity and constantly do your will. Bless us with good government, honest industry, truthful education, and an honorable way of life. Preserve and save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil course of action. May all people strive to become united in their thinking and endeavors. May there be justice, peace, and a common purpose, for, especially in our land. When times are prosperous, let our hearts be thankful and in troubled times, may we trust in you without fail. We pray, we pray for the mission of the church at large. Merciful God, we humbly implore you to cast the bright beams of your light upon your church, that we, being instructed by the doctrine of the blessed apostles, may walk in the light of your truth and finally attain to the light of everlasting life. Grant to your church, your Holy Spirit, and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound, but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you and in the confession of your name abide until the end. We pray for the ministry of All Saints Lutheran Church. Almighty and gracious God, you have called this congregation to witness that in Christ Jesus, you have reconciled us to yourself. Grant that by your Holy Spirit, we may proclaim the good news of your salvation so that all who hear it may receive the gift of salvation. We pray that you send us forth in word and deed as laborers into the harvest field of our community and region. Grant that we, being instructed, reproved, corrected, and trained by your word, may be fully equipped for every good work of Christ's righteousness and with those things that are well-pleasing and profitable for the salvation of those with whom we encounter and engage. We pray for the members of all saints. O holy and most merciful God, you have taught us the way of your commands. We implore you to pour out your grace into our hearts. Cause it to bear fruit in us that we may always be directed to your will and daily increase in love toward you, one another, and our neighbors. As you bless your servants here at All Saints with various and unique gifts of the Holy Spirit, continue to grant us discernment, direction, and opportunity to eagerly use them always in service to you and our neighbor for your, whole, for your honor and glory. We pray for, for those who struggle, struggle those in severe pain of hurt, helplessness, and hopelessness. Everlasting, Almighty and everlasting God, you desire not the death of a sinner, but that all would repent and live. Hear our prayers for those outside your kingdom. Take away their iniquity and turn the hearts of those who have doubted your truth and forsaken the faith of Christ. Mercifully comfort the minds and hearts of all who are broken by the pains and burdens of sin in this world. Today especially, we pray for Ray, Shane, Hannah, Declan, Mark, Kevin, Olivia, June, and Wendy. Graciously strengthen them to remain steadfast in this time of affliction and grant them patience and peace to endure their difficult struggle. And if it be your will, to restore them in your care. 
All these things we ask in the name of the one who intercedes on our behalf and who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You can be seated. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen.